Welcome to the Murder Under the Midnight Sun Halloween Special. It's my favorite holiday, and as such, I've decided to create this special for you, which brings together some of my favorite podcasters. I ask them to submit a story from their childhood, either a local legend, an urban legend, or a folktale that freaked them out. I think a lot of us got into true crime because of something that ignited our passion when we were young, so I thought for this Halloween it would be fun to go back to the roots. So I hope you enjoy these stories, and I hope you have a fantastic Halloween. So first up, I've got a classic story for you from my good friend Samara Morgan, who was a guest host with me on the Sinister Sisters podcast, and who is also a co-host on my new horror podcast, Death Rattle. Enjoy! The Green Ribbon Once there was a girl named Jenny. She was like all of the other girls, except for one thing. She always wore a green ribbon around her neck. There was a boy named Alfred in her class. Alfred liked Jenny, and Jenny liked Alfred. One day he asked her, Why do you wear that ribbon all the time? I cannot tell you, said Jenny. But Alfred kept asking, Why do you wear it? And Jenny would say, It's not important. Jenny and Alfred grew up and fell in love. One day they got married. After their wedding, Alfred said, Now that we are married, you must tell me about the green ribbon. You still must wait, said Jenny. I will tell you when the right time comes. Years passed. Alfred and Jenny grew old. One day Jenny became very sick. The doctor told her she was dying. Jenny called Alfred to her side. Alfred, she said, now I can tell you about the green ribbon. Untie it, and you will see why I could not tell you before. Slowly and carefully, Alfred untied the ribbon, and Jenny's head fell off. Next up, we have a hometown story from two more wonderful podcast hosts, Rachel and David from the All Bad Things podcast. Hello, I'm Rachel. <laughs> and I'm David. And this is the All Bad Things Spooky Story, 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 2018. Kill, kill, kill. Them, them. <laughs> so I understand, David, that you have a... You, un- you understand, David. <laughs> yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> you <laughs> are going to give me a very hard time. Um, that you have a scary story... Based around your hometown of Messina, New York. Yes, I do. Um, this revolves around anybody who is my age, around my age. Again, I got to be ageist here. Yeah, of the uh, over forty set. <laughs> the what? <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. I forget about that sometimes. <laughs> Uh, basically, um, I was born in 1977, so my childhood, like, the bulk of my childhood was in the, uh, 80s. Mm -hmm. The childhood I remember. You know, late 80s. Um, throughout, this kind of began in the early to mid 80s, um, kind of revolved around, um, the Parents Music Resource Center. Um, what I'm talking Mm -hmm. about is the Satanic Panic, which began... It's got roots that go back to like the 60s and 70s, but it really gained momentum and started to get like national uh, exposure in the eight- when I was a little kid, when I was right, growing up, right. you know, because of MTV, because of heavy metal, mm-hmm. because of music and movie like horror movies. So it was just, yeah. it was basically at the time, it was like the Red Scare of the 80s mm. where you had priests and fucking conservative idiots trying to scare the shit out of people, trying to convince mm-hmm. people that they're are these satanic groups all over America. Right. Which I'm sure there were in cities here and there, like if you were in Los Angeles or Seattle or... Maybe. Yeah. But it's 
It, it's mo- mostly just crazy people using it's it as an excuse. It's just dumb if, shit. If that, yes, yeah. it's just dumb shit meant to scare up yeah. parents, yeah. you know, so they'll uh-huh. buy a gun and a fucking security system. So I'm going to guess the satanic panic was going pretty strong in the little town of Messina, New York, then during the 80s. That's why you know that this thing is completely full of shit. Uh-huh. Like, I grew up in a town of, like, twelve to 13,000 people, mm-hmm. factory town. Every town around us was the same size, even a little bit smaller. So this is a an urban legend, like from your. It's not necessarily an urban legend because, oh. like we just learned with the West Memphis Three, mm-hmm. kids went to jail over false accusations right. all over the country right. because yeah. of this yeah, shit. Yeah, so it could. You know, get so um, and there are still cases. That there are still kids in well, they're not kids anymore. People in jail today mm-hmm. that were falsely, uh, you know, just dumb shit. Yeah. yeah. So basically, the legend in my hometown, coming from the older kids, you know, mm-hmm. like the high school kids, mm-hmm. there were several foot foot bridges leading to um, Alcoa, which is which an is aluminum the, the aluminum plant aluminum plant there. in my hometown because it was a it was a factory town. Like oh you yeah. Said, yeah. Yep. Um, when I was growing up, when I was a little kid, we had Alcoa, Reynolds, which, mm-hmm. Reynolds wrap. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, aluminum foil. Mm-hmm. They do other stuff, obviously, but, and also GM powertrain were all oh, in my okay. town. So that's where everybody works, pretty right. much. And mm-hmm. everybody, you know, made a pretty good living. Cost of living wasn't, was not really much where yeah. I grew up, so. But, um, so there are several foot bridges leading to this plant because it's it's a fucking huge plant i mean it's sprawled across acres right so there was this one particular footbridge and i cannot remember the name of the street anymore but it was just it was always dark Mm. and it was always just it was just kind of like a old path that people didn't really use that much anymore but it was Uh still there Uh and so the older kids would Uh say that's where the devil worshipers hang out oh (laughs) like and at night you know, mm-hmm. they um, start fires and drink alcohol and they smoke marijuana. <gasps> oh. <laughs> yeah, we're talking like in the late 80s. Like, marijuana is still very much counterculture at right, this point. So right. if if somebody's telling you some kid is, you know, smoking marijuana, you're like, he's a bad kid. <laughs> like, this is just, this is the just say no era. Right, right. The Reaganomics. But, um, and all that. Uh, I remember, but just this was one particular night, mm. um, because um, my cousin's house was in between. With this spot was like right in between my cousin's house and where I lived. Okay. So I remember um, coming back from my cousin's house on a on bikes. Me and a, me and a friend of mine. How old were you? Was probably. I think I was 12. I think it was in sixth grade. Okay. Pretty sure I was. So this is late 80s. Yeah, this would be 88, 89, 89, 89 actually, yeah, if I'm 12. Um, but uh, I was riding with my friend Jimmy, and there were these two older kids that we kind of came across. One of them lived across the street from me, and I fucking cannot remember his name for the life of me. But anyway, he was considered like... One of, like, the burnout kids. The bad kids, yeah. And Potential prob- probably, sm- oh, fuck yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> smoked marijuana and all that kind of stuff. So, like, we came across them, and I remember him, one of them saying, he was like, hey, like, you want to see the body over here? Oh, my God. And we were like, what the fuck? And we were Is like. Is this at night? Yes. Oh, it's, like, it's like dusk. dusk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and me and my friend were like. Because he was an older kid, yeah. knew him from, we kind of didn't want to be pussies, so we were just kind of like, okay, like, he's probably fucking with us, yeah. but, you know, whatever. And so we go over to him, and he's he's just like, yeah, we'll just go down by the footbridge over there, and yeah. then we're starting to kind of, like, I remember talking about this with the match, and then we're kind of starting to panic, like... Because you didn't want to go down like, by the... Like, we didn't want to go to, like, the footbridge where all the... Did you think Devil you were going to be verse? sacrificed? I don't fucking... Like I said, there was there was a part of me, mostly, that this kid's fucking with us. Yeah. But there's that little part where you're mm-hmm. like, but what, what, if, not? what, if, what yeah, if he isn't? Yeah. And so we kind of get to that area. Mm-hmm. And, dude, this is late 80s stupid kid shit. He actually carried like a switchblade. Oh, but yeah. I, but everybody knew it. It okay. wasn't like a big deal. But, um, like... He takes it out and he's like, 
It's like the body's right over there. And he's like, I want you to go cut it up. What? And he like turns the, he turns to me and says this. And I'm just like, at that point, I was just like, didn't know what to say. And he, then he goes, I'm just fucking with you. Oh, God. <laughs> just, oh, my God. <laughs> How old was this older kid? He was probably 15. So he was like three years older than me. Shit. Yeah, he was, it was just punk. fucking, yeah, just fucking around. Well, that's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> Stupid kids. Yeah. But that's, I Doing mean, shit like that to other kids. Yeah. But it, like I said, like the whole time, like I knew like he was yeah. fucking with us, but there was just that little part of, you know, maybe not. And plus like the whole, um, the culture of that time was mm-hmm. completely different. I mean, so there was, oh yeah, this is still in the middle of the Cold War. Yeah, Yeah, there's a lot of paranoia. Although the Cold War is just about to end. Yeah. Um, But yeah, there's there's that, there's the whole, it's, yeah, Reagan's America, just all that bullshit. Just that time in America alone is a little scary in retrospect. It's weird and different. It almost seems like it's not even the same country. Yeah. Yeah, it's just... Yeah, well, so much happened... In the past 30 years, not the least of which was the internet. You know, yeah. Which really changed everything. Mm-hmm. Well, that was really annoying of that older kid. I feel kind of mad at that old older kid. I hate yeah, kids whatever. who do shit like that. That's yeah. stupid. Don't go Stuff scaring, like that happened all the time when I was Don't go scaring up. little kids this Halloween, people. <laughs> this was... <laughs> This wasn't on Halloween. Well, still, but it was just a. Uh, we're, we're, yeah. This is all being released True. on Halloween. So actually, anyway. it would have been actually uh, looking back on it, it. I think it was around this time of year. Yeah, fall. I, I remember it being in the fall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. So anyway, that's our uh, that's our little contribution. Our, yeah, our contribution. Thank you to Murder Under the Midnight Sun. Yes. I like. I love saying it. Murder Under the Midnight Sun. <laughs> What's your best one? Mur- mere deer under the midnight sun. Mere, <laughs> mere deer. Mere deer. <laughs> it, it, no, R is the most. Uh, mere deer. It, was it Dwight Schrute said R is the most threatening of all consonants. It's why it's murder and not muck duck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that one. <laughs> anyway, so thank you for having us. That was our contribution. And TTFN. watch out for the watch out for the satanic panic people. <laughs> Hey, this is Steven Pacheco, the host of Trace Evidence, and I'm going to tell you a story from my home state of New York. Every town has some kind of local legend buried somewhere beneath the surface. In New York, on Long Island, there's a lake in Suffolk County called Lake Ronkonkoma. It's the largest lake on the entire island, and as you might expect, It has its fair share of secrets and legends. Long Island history is heavily tied in with Native American history, and many of the towns spread across the 118-mile island are named after Native American tribes that once populated the area. The Shinnecocks, Setaukets, Montaukets. Many of these tribes viewed Lake Ronkonkoma as a sacred place, and in fact, Beyond being a sacred location, it was a place which mystified them. There was a belief that the lake itself harbored powers beyond their understanding. Many believed that the waters of the lake could heal a variety of ailments, from sickness to physical disabilities. By the late 1800s, the lake would become a health resort area, with people traveling from all around the world to soak themselves in the magical waters of the lake. The Native Americans had often used the spot as a place to seek treatment, but there were also darker stories emanating from its unexplored depths. There were countless tales of drownings, of bodies vanishing into the lake. The full count of those who were pulled beneath the waters can't be known for sure, but what became so fascinating about it was where they ended up. Not everyone who drowned in the lake was recovered, but in some cases, bodies were found in different areas than the lake itself. Sometimes they would float down the Konekwat River, and other times as far as the Great South Bay. 
This gave rise to the belief that the lake itself was bottomless, that it was tied to all the bodies of water across all of Long Island, and that sinking into its depths, one might find a vast network of underground caverns and passageways. There was even a belief that the lake itself might exist as some kind of a magical location, transporting those who fell beneath its placid surface into a realm unknown to man. The nature of the lake was only more strongly perceived as mysterious when it was observed that, over time, the lake would rise and fall without explanation, without rainfall. The lake would rise up and swallow the nearby beaches, encroaching into the forestry, and then, for no reason at all, it would slowly slither back down the shore and reset to its normal status. The Native American tribes believed the Great Spirit lived in the lake and that its anger was represented in the rising waters. It was commonly believed that, someday, the Great Spirit of the lake would rage so ferociously that the water would simply not stop rising until it had consumed and submerged all of Long Island itself, pulling the land down into the darkness of its mysterious depths. So what was it that angered the spirit of the lake so greatly? It was not war, nor destruction of the land, but drowning itself. When someone sunk beneath the surface and never returned, it was said that the great spirit was wrathful of those who dared enter his domain. While many of these stories have since faded into obscurity, there is one today which is still told amongst the people of Long Island, and it ties together the native cultures that once made their home on the island, and the settlers who came along and captured the lands. That is the story that has become known as the Lady of the Lake. According to the story, passed down by word of mouth first amongst the natives, then to the settlers, and today, amongst those who have visited the lake, or even simply live on the island itself, the story talks of a native princess. Her father was the chief of the Setauket Sachem tribe. One day, while out in the forest, this princess saw a white man. It said that their eyes met. It was love at first sight. Her name has been lost to time, but we do know that he was named Hugh Birdsall. Despite the language barrier, the connection between the two was impossible to miss. The electricity of their chemistry overcame everything around them, and it's said that when the princess returned to her tribe, she confessed her love. It was then that she was told her love was forbidden, that she could not be with Birdsall, could never marry him, and that she was bound to her own people. If she dared to pursue the man, he would surely be killed to keep the two from getting together. In order to protect both herself and Birdsall, the two would meet in secret and communicate via hidden messages. The princess would scribe notes of her undying love and set them afloat on patches of birch bark into Lake Ronkonkoma. Birdsall would find the notes and send his own in return. When it was safe enough, the two would see one another, but it was not often and they were not able to be together for long. The secret relationship between Birdsall and the princess continued for nearly seven years. However, the pain of longing, of the desperation to be together, would become too much for the princess to bear. She knew that this man was the love of her life, and that if she couldn't give herself to him, he would ultimately find another. In the eleventh month of the seventh year, the princess climbed into a canoe and pushed herself out onto the waters of Lake Ronkonkoma. There, floating on her back, with the moon on her face, she professed her love for Birdsall, and as she wept, she drew a blade and pierced her own heart, unable to bear the pain any longer. The next morning, Birdsall found the canoe, not far from where her notes were often floating, and was overwhelmed with grief and sorrow. What became of Birdsall himself is unknown. Some believe he left Long Island and disappeared into the West, heartbroken and directionless. Others have said that the princess's father, in his grief, 
murdered the man he believed had caused his daughter's death. Others still think that Birdsall never left the area and spent the rest of his life mourning the princess from the shores of the lake. Following her death, it was believed by the tribes that the princess had not left the lake, but had in fact become a part of it. It was said that her anger and her grief surged in whirlpools and the crashing of waves. The rise and fall of the lake was thought to perhaps be tied to the princess, that the lake would rise up as her tears swelled in agony. Many believe that if you approach the lake at just the right time, you could even hear her sorrowful wailing echoing through the darkness, skipping across the surface like a stone. Her pain, however, could not be contained within the lake itself. Her spirit was seen, dwelling beneath the surface. A specter of blinding white was reported to reveal itself on the eleventh month of every seventh year, but the princess was not at peace simply by showing herself. She soon began to take what she wanted. Every year, it is said, thousands go swimming in Lake Ronkonkoma. Of the thousands who tread into the princess's lake, one man each year does not return to the shore. The princess rises up from the waters every year, her spirit stirred up by her love for Birdsall. And when a man who bears a resemblance to her lost love steps into her domain, the princess reaches out and pulls him beneath the surface in desperation to spend eternity with the one she loves. Each year, when a man drowns in Lake Ronkonkoma, it's believed that, at least for that year, the princess has been satisfied. But she can never find the one she truly seeks, and so... She will never stop pulling men beneath the waters of the lake, and the people of Long Island, no matter how much time may pass, will always tell her story and warn young men who dare to dive into the waters of the terror that might lie in the darkness of Lake Ronkonkoma. Hello everyone, my name is Ud Gallifrey and I've been asked to relay some tales from my neck of the woods. Along the river that goes to the center of Saskatoon is a road known as Spadina. It's a beautiful drive. A lot of the view along the road is completely unblocked because a large part of Spadina's drive is just... Land bought out by the city to be made into walking paths. But when the houses begin, you'll find the ghost of a foundation within the ground that existed a long time ago. Now, there are a lot of rumors circulating about what exactly this foundation was, but the legend going around goes something like this. Decades ago, possibly in the 1950s, a family lived a quiet life for years in the house that stood there. They made an average living, they were a middle class family, they were happy. But one day, the house burned down, killing each member of the family, wife, son, daughter, and the pet dog, leaving the only member of the family alive, the grief-stricken father, who was busy doing a night shift at his job. He soon moved far away. Eventually, the insurance company settled on the house and was able to rebuild it and sell it back to the city to be sold again. It was a viable property. And a new family moved in and enjoyed another happy life. Eventually, the father, the original father, many years later, returned to the place where his family once lived and the legend goes that he was so enraged and furious at the sight of a happy family where his once stood that he fell into a rage. Eventually this rage stewed and stewed until it bubbled over. In the middle of the night he returned with an accelerant and set the house ablaze again, 
killing the entire family in the process. And as the house burnt to the ground, as the family burn, he jumped off of the bridge nearby the house, into the river, and drowned. And to this day the empty foundation has sat, overgrown, unused. I wonder if superstition is keeping the city of Saskatoon from rebuilding. Hello everyone, my name is Jim. My name is Kate Karen. We host the Forgotten News Podcast. And I also host the Whispered True Stories Podcast. Thank you, Ariel, for inviting us to join you on your podcast, Murder Under the Midnight Sun. It's a really top-notch true crime show, and so we feel kind of honored to be part of it. Ariel asked if we knew any urban legends or spooky stories that we had heard in our hometown. Well, Jim and I grew up in completely different areas of the U.S., and so our experiences were completely different. Also, personally, I cannot remember ever being told anything by anybody that could even be considered to be an urban legend or a supposedly true ghost story. But guess what? Jim has one that his father told him back when he was a teenager. So take it away, Jim. Thank you, Kit. I'm going to start by mentioning that if any listeners have heard the Forgotten News podcast, then they may already know that I live in Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up here. We have one daily newspaper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer, which has been in business since 1842. I've always liked that name. So did Winston Churchill, who was Prime Minister of England during the 1940s. He once said that he thought it had the best name of any newspaper in the world. Well, anyway, you may be wondering, why am I telling you all about the Cleveland Plain Dealer? Yes. Well, it's because my dad worked for the Plain Dealer for his entire adult life. He was a truck driver, delivering the newspaper to stores, to offices, and to all sorts of other places, both downtown and neighborhoods all over the city. This was a nighttime job. And he did it for over 50 years until he retired. That's incredible. Well, long story short, because of the nature of his job, he met a lot of people from all walks of life. He knew people who were rich. He knew lots of people who were poor. He knew politicians. He knew priests. He knew thieves. He knew gamblers. He knew cops and crooks. He knew the taxi drivers who worked downtown and who would often buy a paper from him while they were waiting for the next person who needed a ride somewhere. Mm. The story that I am about to tell revolves around one of those taxi drivers. So keep that in mind, because I need to take a short detour, and then I'll circle back. So here's where I come into the story. One day, when I was in high school, my dad happened to see a book of ghost stories that I had gotten from the library for a book report. There was a story in the book about a hitchhiker who was given a ride by someone, but who later turned out to be the ghost of a woman who had been hitchhiking for the first time and had a heart attack and died shortly after being picked up along the roadside. Oh my gosh. My dad noticed the story, and then he told me a story that he had heard from one of his taxi driver friends and who swore that it was absolutely true. This man had been a taxi driver in Cleveland for many years, including during World War II. Anyway, one day, sometime in the spring of 1945, he was parked downtown near a hotel, waiting for someone who needed a ride to show up. So he was sitting there, and he happened to turn his head, and he suddenly saw a nun, very young, very pretty, but nevertheless a nun sitting in the back seat. He was a little shocked because he hadn't seen her get in or even heard her get in. And she didn't say anything after she did get in. So he asked her where she wanted to go. She told him the name of her convent, 
which was part of a church about 10 or 15 miles away. So he began to drive in that direction. After a little while, he turned his head and asked her to pray for his son, who was in the army fighting against the Nazis in Europe. She told him not to worry, because the war would be over before the year was over, and his son would be coming home soon, safe and uninjured. Wait, what? After hearing this, he said, I'm glad you feel so sure about it, sister. He didn't know what else to say, and so that was the end of their conversation. Then a few minutes went by. He arrived at the convent, and he turned around to tell her what she owed for the ride. But she wasn't there. He hadn't seen or heard her get out. No way. He first assumed that she had run inside to get the money to pay him. So he sat and waited. But when five or ten minutes had gone by and she didn't come out, he went inside and was sent to the office of the mother superior. He told her what had happened. The mother superior first responded by telling him that, as far as she knew, no sister from the convent had been downtown that day. But then, just in case she was wrong, she asked, what did the sister look like? The taxi driver started to describe her. Then he happened to see a framed photograph sitting on the desk. He pointed at it, then said, that's her in the picture. The mother superior looked at the driver, then spoke as a tear rolled down her face. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what to tell you. But the sister in that photograph was killed a year ago while she was standing at a street corner downtown. I think she was on her way back from a meeting of some sort. The sister had stepped off a curb just for a moment, looking around for a bus or a taxi to bring her back here. She was hit from behind by a drunk driver going the wrong way who didn't see her. Oh, my gosh. The taxi driver was stunned. He didn't know what to say, except... I'm sorry for your loss. The mother superior took out her purse and tried to give him the money for the fare. But he told her, no, you keep it. What a story. The taxi driver swore it was true. And my dad said he believed it because both of her promises to the taxi driver came true. I am just blown away. World War II did end before the year. 1945 was over and his son did come home safe and uninjured that's incredible and so who knows i wasn't there i don't know what to say and in any event that's the end of my story it was definitely different than the stories we tell in the forgotten news podcast although who knows you might hear something similar on my new show, The Whispered True Stories Podcast. Except that it would be told in whisper. <laughs> and with that being said, we will now turn the episode back to Ariel. Happy Halloween, everybody. Happy Halloween, Ariel. Hey, this is Kate from Ignorance Was Bliss. And I have a ghost story for you that scared the bejesus out of me when I was a kid. And part of the reason it scared the bejesus out of me is because I was born into a family where the generations are a little bit closer together than average. So I had a bunch of grandmothers and great grandmothers and all of them really thought that I needed collector dolls in my life. So I had a metric crapload of them. So the story that I heard was not from them. It came from a time when my mother was a Girl Scout leader and we took the troop down to Hershey Park in Pennsylvania. We lived in upstate New York. So the drive was, I mean, I was eight or nine, so... It felt like six or eight hours, but it was probably only two or three. And this is in the days before silliness like seat belts or even seats were mandated by law. So while you were in the back of a creeper van, it was gray and not white, but otherwise it was a creeper van. No windows, 
two seats up front and nothing in the back. And when I say nothing, I mean not even carpeting. It was just metal. So my parents or my mother and the Girl Scout leader, I guess, they sat up front and we all piled in the back. And there were probably half a dozen Girl Scouts who were all several years older than me. I was eight or nine, maybe as old as 10, but probably not. But I got to tag along because my mother, being co-leader, got to bring whoever she damn well pleased. Driving down, it was no big deal. Everybody's excited for the park. And I don't know. I don't remember what they talked about. I don't remember anything about the trip down. Driving home, everybody's tired. And it's really dark. And it's late. And they start telling stories to keep each other awake. So it's like a sleepover, only in the back of a creeper van. Like you do. And one girl tells a story about being at her grandmother's house visiting. And her grandmother has, among other things, a collector doll that sat high up on a bookshelf. And she never liked it. She always kind of side-eyed that sucker when she was there, but she kind of ignored it. And one day, her grandmother came into the room, and as she moved around, she sort of bumped the shelf a little, and she looked up high and visibly shuddered and said, I've never liked that doll. It has been in my family for generations. I can't get rid of it, but I just hate that thing. And she turned and walked away. And the little girl could swear that that doll watched her as she left. No, no, of course it didn't, whatever. So everybody went to sleep that night, and at one point, the little girl woke up because she heard this weird sort of skittering and shuffling, and then almost like little tiny footsteps, sort of. What was, what was, uh, nothing. She probably was just having a dream, right? And she woke up the next morning, and... She noticed that it seemed like that doll was one shelf lower than it had been before. But as soon as she started to form the thought, she heard a commotion in the house, and when she went to investigate, she learned that during the night her grandmother had died. Heart attack, they said. Natural causes. Except she died with a pillow over her face. How strange. Perhaps she always slept that way? Oh, I, okay, it is what it is, I suppose. And so within a few days, the family gathered and they started parsing out who got what from the grandmother's house. And there's a tremendous argument between the mother and mom's siblings. I don't want you. No, you take it. I, no, I'm taking this. You take, you have to, I don't want it. And, and around and around until finally her mother stomped out. And she looked at the little girl, and she said, I guess I have to take that stupid doll. And the girl looked at the doll, and it was almost like they made eye contact for a second. But that couldn't be. Uh, No. So they went back home, and time passed. And after a little bit, the mother started to unpack the grandmother's possessions. And when she got to the collector doll, she visibly shuddered and said, I just hate this thing. I don't know why. And she looked around, and she found the tallest bookshelf in their house. A little bit shorter than the one in the grandmother's house, but good enough. And she put it up as high as she could reach. And she walked away. And the little girl looked at it, and it seemed like the doll watched her mother leave, but again, you know, the overactive imagination, all the grown-ups told her so. And that night... She heard the little skittering and shuffling and tiny footsteps, but she blamed it on the cat and went back to sleep. And when she woke up the next morning, she walked past that bookshelf, and she was pretty certain that that doll was a shelf lower than it had been. And then, once again, a commotion, and it turns out, they said that the mother had a seizure during the night and died. How awful. How sudden. No history. 
She's not a normal age to get epilepsy. What happened? They never knew. It was just this terrible thing. They didn't have any other explanation for it. But sometimes in life, that's all you get. So they went on with their lives. She and her brother and their father, they did the best they could. And one day, she and her brother were playing in the room where the doll was. He was bouncing a ball, and he bounced it a little too high, and it ended up knocking into the shelves where that doll sat, and it jarred everything a little bit loose. And he did what he could to straighten it back to where it was, and when he got to the doll, he shied away. He didn't like it, and he said to her, this thing is just ugly and stupid. And he shoved it back on the bookshelf, but it was one shelf too low, and she was just about to tell him, but he just grabbed up his ball and left the room. And the girl looked, and this time she was absolutely positive that she saw that doll's face change. It suddenly looked angry. It suddenly looked wrong. And so she left the room, too. Within minutes, there was the terrible screech of brakes. There was the terrible scream of a child. And suddenly her brother was dead. Why was he even in the road? How did he get there that fast? His ball was sitting there next to the front door. Why would he have... Nobody... It was... Just done. How do you live through the death of a child? Well, you just keep living. There's not much answer. And the girl did what she could to sort of prop her father up. And her father enrolled the girl in several different activities such as Girl Scouts, to try to keep her spirits up, to try to give her things to do that were not in the house with him. And time passed. Her father was not coping very well. He started drinking. He wasn't taking care of himself. Life was very hard. And so he decided, it's time to move things around. It's time to change things up. And they started to get ready for a move, and they started packing up boxes, and they started putting things away, and he got to the shelf where the doll was, and he was pulling things off the shelf and putting them away in a box, and he got to the doll, and he cringed, and he said, you know, I just, I just don't like this thing, and he took it out off the shelf, but just put it on the floor, he didn't put it in a box, and left the room. And came in later and said, we'll do the rest tomorrow, not now. And she looked at the doll and she hadn't seen its face because it's face down on the floor. But she was pretty sure that the doll was unhappy. But she didn't know what to do. So she went to bed that night and she heard that similar shuffling, skittering footstep noise. And this time she couldn't sleep. She couldn't sleep all night, but she didn't hear anything exactly. At times, she thought that she heard her father sort of maybe breathing funny or maybe just snoring. She wasn't sure, and she didn't dare get out of breath. And the next day, she got up, and she walked past that doll. But now it was sitting up, leaning against the wall. And she stared at it, and it stared back at her with a kind of smile that she'd never seen before so she ran past and she ran into the living room and she found her father as she'd found him before often he just fell asleep in the chair after drinking but this time he wasn't breathing and this time she screamed and panicked and she really didn't remember much from the rest of that day But it turns out they said that her father had finally just had too much to drink. He had finally just passed over his own body's ability to cope. She didn't think so. There weren't bottles of alcohol in the house anywhere that she could see. But what does she know? So the house packing happened at a faster rate. And when her mother's brother showed up, he looked at the doll and he looked at her and he said, we will pack that up in a box and we will never take it out again because I think it's time for you to start everything new. 
and the girl agreed, because there were no shelves lower for that doll to go, and so she was pretty sure that if that doll decided to get up one night and go for a walk, that she'd be next. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. Thank you for letting me into your ear holes today. It's quite an honor. By the way, I'm Oud Gallifrey of the Occulte Veritatis Podcast. You can find us at ovpod.ca. But it's not about me today. It's about the story. What I'm about to tell you happened to my grandpa's dad, my great-grandfather, with my grandpa witnessing... Saskatchewan has a lot of farming legends. For those of you that didn't know, I live in Saskatchewan. It's the flyover land of Canada where all the farmers roam. And people spin a lot of yarns here out of boredom. My grandfather's name was Eugene, and he was just eight years old at the time of this incident. He had his summer routine down. His mom would make a pack of sandwiches and cheese and high-calorie stuff that a farmer's body will need to keep moving throughout the day, and she would give it to my grandfather to run out to his dad. His dad's name was Mike. So one day he ran out this bundle of, I think it was ham sandwiches, and wrapped up bacon fat with cheese. It sounds gross, but it actually tastes quite good. And he ran out these sandwiches like normal. Now, most days, uh, the other farmers that my grandfather's dad worked with also had their family members run stuff out. But this day, Grandpa was all by himself. Uh, His other workers had gone home to their houses. I think it was near a holiday, and they still had leftover turkey and all that good stuff. But when he got to the regular place, he couldn't find his grandfather. And he searched around, and he looked around the farm equipment, and he looked behind uh, this shed that they kept fair sp- spare farm parts in. And he found a big, black, shadowy figure standing over my grandfather. He didn't know what to do. He said it looked like a dog, except its edges were all misshapen and shimmering. And instead of it being furry and being, instead of it looking like an animal, it simply looked like a plague of bees formed into the shape of a wolf. To this day, I don't think my grandpa had the words to describe what he saw. Anyways, he carried the lunches in this big pail. Uh, He didn't have a backpack and his family was quite poor, so he just used a big copper pail to carry this stuff around and as soon as he spotted this thing he did the only thing he thought he could and he swung the bucket as hard as he can at the shadowy figure and as soon as the bucket hit its form it seemed to dissipate now my grandpa passed some time ago but to this day, I remember the look in his eyes when he was trying to describe what it felt like to hit this thing with the bucket. He would stare off above my shoulder like he was lost in thought trying to find the words. He said it was it was similar to passing through water, except it seemed way more rough. It almost seemed scrapey. Like it had more friction, like it was scraping against gravel. But yet it was hanging in the air like a shadow. So this thing dissipates, and he never saw it again. And His dad was diabetic, so he got some sweets out of his pocket and some water and gave it to his dad, and his dad woke up. Um, so his dad, my great-grandfather, never believed my grandfather. He thought it was just youthful in discretion, and he was panicked seeing his dad passed out, so he was hallucinating. But my grandpa swears to this day he saw that creature, that mass of angry, buzzing shadows in the the shape of a dog standing over his unconscious dad. 
Oh, and his dad never had a mark on him. I wonder what would have happened, assuming this thing is real, what would have happened if my grandpa were ten minutes late? Was this thing trying to feed? Was this thing trying to steal souls? And this is coming from the perspective of somebody who doesn't really believe in this shit. I don't really believe in the ghost, but the conviction in my grandpa's eyes, I don't know, it's hard to argue with. Anyways, that's my story. Um, me and two friends run a little podcast called Occulte Veritatis. It's basically, we smoke weed and drink and talk about horrible things that are too hard to talk about sober. And we try and find a hidden truth within each episode. So find us at ovpod.ca. I want to give a massive thank you to everyone that submitted. I personally grew up reading and telling these kinds of stories and even though I'm not superstitious in any way anymore, they're still a lot of fun. So thank you guys so much for your wonderful stories. You're all such great storytellers. It really made this episode amazing. And thank you listeners for joining us today on this wonderful Halloween. I hope you have a great night and get a lot of candy, but hopefully not from a stranger in a van. We all know how that turns out. Good night.